Bob Black, in 1985, entitled The Abolition of Work, read, No one should ever work. Work is the source of nearly all the misery in the world. <laughs> Hang on a minute. I'm preaching on this today, all right? All, he said, this is what he said. Almost any evil you'd care to name comes from working or from living in a world designed for work. So in order to stop suffering, we have to stop working. <laughs> that is quite the interesting uh, ideal, don't you think? Concept of living, interesting to say the least. And while I only got through the first six pages of his anarchist dissertation, and then I actually did scan the rest, I did see that Black views work as a mockery of freedom, he called it. A mockery of freedom. Even denounces as hypocrites the various thinkers who support freedom while supporting work. And, and, and having to work, Black alleges, pe makes people stupid and creates the fear of freedom. He says because of work, people become accustomed to rigidity and regularity, and thus they do not have time uh, to have meaningful friendships and meaningful activities. Many workers, he argues, are dis so dissatisfied with their work as evidenced by absenteeism, embezzlement, sabotage, and gold bricking. You ever heard of gold bricking before? Anybody here heard of gold bricking? I'd never heard that phrase before, so I had to look it up, right? What does that mean? Well, gold, you're gonna, some of you don't know this term. You're going to say, ah, yeah. Gold bricking, gold bricking is the practice of doing less than work. I'm sorry. The practice of doing less work than one is able to while maintaining the appearance of working. Right? Anybody like that in your work world? All right? They act super busy all the time. Oh, I'm so busy. Oh, I got so much going on. Oh, I just got so much going on. And they actually don't do anything. Right? The term originates from the trick of applying a gold coating uh, to a brick of worthless metal. While the worker may appear industrious on the surface, in reality they are less than. A modern example is staff who use their work internet for personal reasons, which can lead to inefficiency. Gold bricking online is referred to as cyber slacking or cyber loafing, surfing on Facebook or Pinterest while you're supposed to be working. You see, in our leisure-loving culture, some would wholeheartedly, you know, echo black sentiment. No work, no work, yay, all play. That, they would love that. They would love that. What does Jack Nicholson say in The Shining? Anybody remember? All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Yes? You know, Americans spend approximately 50% of their waking hours devoted to work. And so the question becomes then, is work a curse? Or is work something that humans were uniquely designed to do? Well, in stark contrast to the assertions of Bob Black, the significance and the, the, the beneficial nature of work is a resounding theme in the Bible. Grab your Bibles, if you will. We're going to look at this issue today, and I want you to turn to the book of Proverbs, all right? Last week I told you. Make sure you bring your Bibles, bring your Bibles. If it's not on your phone or your mobile device, bring your Bible that kind of looks like this. And, and if you have a hard copy Bible, bring, you know, it has a little or ribbony thing, put the ribbon in the book of Proverbs. Because all this month we're going to be spending a time in the book of Proverbs talking about a wisdom. Then in June, July, and August, we're actually going to be preaching through the book of John. And so I want you to bring your Bibles. If you need a Bible, raise your hands real high. And uh, our servers are ready to bring one down to you. Don't be shy. We want you to follow along. I want you to follow along as we look at the beneficial nature of work. And, and I realize some work is boring. Anybody here? Be real honest. Anybody here just bored with your job? Anybody? Okay. Anybody? No? Y'all, some of you, one or two love you, you know, you, you hate your jobs. <laughs> it's boring. You just, it's like you're bored to tears. Every time you go to work, you're just like, ah, right? Some of our work is consuming. Anybody here, your work is just consuming? It consumes your brain? I, uh, I serve as the chairman of, the chairman of the board for a, a group called the Mosaics Global Network, which is a multi-ethnic uh, church network. And this week I was at a, at a conference down in Orlando for a couple days teaching uh, some workshops at a conference with the founder and president of the Mosaics Global Network. And he's a great guy. His name's Mark. He's passionate. He's a, he's a fabulous visionary leader. But he's a workaholic. 
frankly. I mean, every waking moment is consumed with this work, and while it's an amazing work, that's all he thinks about all day long, every single day. It's all he thinks about, and, 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 and uh, he, was, he was leaving on Friday for a long overdue two-week cruise, I'm, I'm sorry, two-week vacation to Italy with his wife. He hasn't been on vacation for years. And as I was leaving to head to the airport, we were walking out uh, uh, from, from uh, one of the rooms, and he had his sunglasses on. I said, Mark, take your sunglasses and look up here at me. I want, you to talk, I want to talk to you for a few moments. I said, I'm, I kind of got up in his grill a little bit. I said, I'm the chairman of the board of this organization, and I'm telling you right now that you are not allowed to even think about Mosaic's global network for the next two weeks. You, you, need to, you need to enjoy your wife, you need to enjoy Italy, you need to enjoy eating, <laughs> you, know, you need to enjoy this vacation. Don't even think about Mosaic's Global Network for the next two weeks. And if you do, I will find out and I will kick your keister. I said keister. And I said, furthermore, Mark, I, I'm telling you now, I'm going to text your wife, Linda, and I'm going to tell her what I said. And, and, and I did. I texted Linda. I said, Linda, this is what I told Mark. And she quickly shot a text back to, that said this. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. The work is consuming. Some of our work is boring. Some of our work is engaging. Some of our work is thankless and, and taxing. Several years ago, Forbes magazine wrote an article after taking a survey and said that the average stay-at-home mom should be making at least $115,000 a year. Can I get an amen in the room? Right? Some of you, Yeah. According to the survey, the typical stay-at-home mom works almost 97 hours a week, spending 13.2 hours a day as a or, 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 13.2 hours a week as a daycare teacher, 3.9 hours a week as a household CEO, 7.6 hours as a psychologist, 14.1 hours as a chef, 15.4 hours as a housekeeper, 6.6 .6 hours doing laundry. Nine and a half hours as a computer operator, 10.7 hours as a facility manager, 7.8 hours as a janitor, and 7.8 hours driving the family vehicle. And that doesn't even mention the moms who work a full-time job or a part-time job. And when they come home, they still have all this stuff that they get to do and they have to do. Sometimes it's thankless and taxing. For some, your work is overwhelming. One of our guys, one of my guys I talked to this week told me uh, about a portion of his job that so overwhelmed him this week that he had to step out and gain his composure, spend a few moments with God before he could go back into his work. Whatever label you put on your work, the fact remains that the struggle is real. The struggle is real. We all deal with how to deal with our jobs and our careers and our vocations, however you want to say it. And so what I want to do today, I want to take a couple of moments in this second week of this series to spend some time talking about and seeking God's wisdom from God's Word as it pertains to our work life. And while the Bible has a lot to say about work, the book of Proverbs also has a lot of really good nuggets of wisdom that we can take from this place. And so that's what I want to look at today. That's kind of how I want to look at it. So grab your outline. First of all, I want to talk about what the Bible says about work. And then secondly, secondly, I want to offer some words of wisdom for our work life. So here's the first thing, what the Bible says about work. A commentator in Bible.org wrote this, The origin of work is depicted in the book of Genesis. In the opening passage, God is the primary worker, busy with the creation of the world. Read Genesis 1, 1 through 15. And the Bible states, some of you know this, that God worked for six days and then on the seventh day he what? He rested, all right? And that passage reveals that God was the first person to do work on the earth. Therefore, here's the first thing that the Bible says and talks about work, is that legitimate work reflects the activity of God. Get that down. Legitimate work reflects the activity of God. You see, because God is inherently good, that means all of God, all of life it can be inherently good, which means work can also be inherently good. And some of you are going, don't tell me that because my work is not good. <laughs> We're going to keep looking at this. Furthermore, Genesis 131 declares that when God viewed the fruit of his labor, he called it very good. Remember that? God examined and assessed the quality of his work and he determined when he had finished his job that he had done a good job. He took pleasure in the outcome of his work and by this example it is apparent, number two, that work should be productive. Work should be productive. 
Work should be conducted in a way that produces the highest quality outcome. The reward for work is the honor and the satisfaction that comes from a job well done. Let's keep going. Another commentator wrote, Psalm 19. Psalm 19 says that God reveals himself to the world by his work. So through, through natural revelation, God's existence is made known to every person on earth. Thus, the work reveals something about the one who's doing the work. It exposes underlying character and motivation and skills and abilities and personality traits. Jesus echoed this, this principle in Matthew chapter 7 when he declared that bad trees produce bad fruit and good trees produce what kind of fruit? Good fruit. Isaiah 43, 7 indicates that God created man for his own glory. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, we read that whatever we do, whatever we do, we should do for his glory. The, the term glory means to give an exact representation or an accurate representation. And so therefore, get this one down, work done by Christians, which is most of us, Work done by Christians should give the world an accurate picture of God in righteousness, faithfulness, and excellence. So think about that last one and think about your workplace. Think about your job. Think about what you do. Do you, as you work your job, whatever your job is, this number four, you know, does, does your work give the world that you work in an accurate picture of God in righteousness, faithfulness, and excellence? And some of you are like, oh man, you're hitting me hard on that one, right? I could go on and on and on but about what the Bible says about work. I could talk about how God created man in his image with characteristics like him. So if you kind of extrapolate that, you know, God was a worker there. That means we also need to be workers. I could talk about how man messed that up in the garden. And, and I could talk about how what happened in the garden changed the nature of work. I could go on and on. Here's what I'm trying to say. The struggle is real. The struggle is real. People who have jobs, which is the majority of us, you have to deal with your jobs. And most people who don't have jobs are desperately trying to find the right job or the ideal job or even just a job. You just want a job. And so this issue affects all of us, nearly every single person. So here's what I did. I scoured through the book of Proverbs the last couple of weeks and I scoured through a bunch of books and I scoured through uh, commentaries and I found over 30 words of wisdom from the book of Proverbs that covers everything from work, working hard, work of his hands, uh, the worker, several more. And while I don't have time to, to look at every single one, and frankly you don't and I don't, I don't have the capacity and the, and the attention span to look at every single one, what I thought we would do today is I thought I would throw out a couple of words of wisdom for our work life. Words of encouragement, words of encouragement to work hard. Words of challenge to rest after you work. You catch that? Words of encouragement to see that no matter what you do, whatever your job is, listen, you can do it for the glory of God. You can do it for the sake of God. You can be an accurate representation of God in your life. And here's what, here's really kind of the bottom line of what I want to accomplish today in this brief little sermon. I hope and pray that when you walk out of here, when this day is over, and you get in your car, and tomorrow you wake up, you don't wake up with this idea and this sentiment that's just like, ah, oh, I gotta go to work today. You wake up tomorrow morning, and you hear the words of Pastor Mont echoing through your brain. That sounds weird, doesn't it? First thing in the morning. But you hear the words of Pastor Mont through the Word of God, echoing this desire to be Jesus in your workplace. So tomorrow morning, to find some joy and excitement when you go to work, because you can be Christ. See, words of encouragement I want to give you, not just about purpose and significance, and not just about climbing the corporate ladder and garnering more and accumulating more and acquiring more, but to love and honor and glorify God more in your work. You know, you can do that. Said that, it is said that man has three basic needs in life, love, purpose, and significance. And a lot of people, a lot of humans try to find purpose and significance in work itself. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verses 4 through 11, Solomon uh, details his search for meaning in his life in, in a variety of projects and all kinds of works of all kinds. And even though his work brought some degree of satisfaction and accomplishment, his conclusion was this. Look at what he said. He said, yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done 
and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. So work should not just be about more stuff and more fame and more money and more accolades and finding all of your source of satisfaction, all of your source of purpose in your job, but that job that you have should be more about God and glorifying God and honoring God and seeing God and being able to reflect God to the people that you work with. Does this make sense? And so when we approach our job, no matter what our job is, no matter what it is. I don't care what your job is. And I don't know what all y'all fo all folks do, right? I don't know what everybody does. But whatever it is, you can do it for the glory of God. So let me give you some words of wisdom from the book of Proverbs. Just little nuggets of wisdom. Get these down. Think through them this week. Here's the first one. Ready? Diligence pays off. The book of Proverbs tells us diligence, praise, plays, uh, uh, diligence pays off. Sorry. Proverbs 14.23 all hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. I love how one commentator illustrated this proverb. Here's what he did. He kind of used this analogy. He said this. He wrote this. Slinging french fries for minimum wage is better than hearing yet another business plan, another business plan, another business plan for making a million. He said this. If you resent this statement, this proverb is probably for you. Dreamers and promoters fantasize about being successful, always looking for the next thing that's going to make them big bucks, big fast money. He says, diligent and godly people go to their same old jobs with thankful hearts and they find success through their hard work. They do not sit around talking with speculators and making spreadsheets of imagined wealth from a new fantasy business. You know people like that? They're always looking for the, the fast way to make a buck and they're always, they're always you know, the, some infomercial comes on the radio or they come, comes on the television and it's like, hey dude, what are you doing? Oh, I got this great business thing and I'm, I'm going to make a lot of money. You too should join my group because we can make a lot of money if we do this and we can do this fast. And, and, and look at these pictures. You know, we can, we can be flying in an airplane like this. You know people like that? Always looking for the fast buck. No, no, here's what he's saying. Here's what he's saying. So some people... Solomon says, some people talk of new businesses, new investments. They're, they're, they're full of ideas of how to make money, but their own success is always just around the corner. They never get there. So Solomon warned his son about the distractions and the delusions of all these money-making schemes, you know, all these business opportunities and investment secrets. Here's what he says, you know, slothful fools and lying promoters, another translation. He said, basically, this is what Solomon's saying. He's saying, son, he says this is his son, son, Overtime at the fryer would be better than getting caught up with some of those guys. What's it say there? In all labor, there is profit. So let's stay on that same analogy. Take the same young man, average young man, diligently, faithfully works hard at a minimum wage, fast food restaurant, fast food job. Maybe in one year, you know, faithful, diligent work, then he could be promoted to shift supervisor. Maybe a year or two later, he could get promoted to shift manager. Maybe or two or three years, he could get promoted to store manager, managing faithfully for a bunch of years. Maybe he could get in on the piece of the action. Maybe even he could buy, you know, buy out the owner someday. Simple, certain, successful, no better ideas, just faithful, hard work. Not bad for slinging french fries, huh? That's what he's saying here. I wrote this sermon a couple of uh, weeks ago. And I used that analogy, I, I picked up on this, this commentator who used that analogy about slinging french fries. And uh, a perfect example, you know, as, as, as I was finalizing this sermon a couple days ago, after, third, uh, after this service, in, in fact about 14 minutes when I'm done, I'm going to walk off this stage and I'm going to go back to my office and pick up a bag and I'm jumping in a car and I'm driving to O'Hare Airport. And I'm jumping on an airplane and I'm flying to Detroit Michigan. I'm going to rent a car and I'm driving 40 minutes north of Detroit. And tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, I'm going to preside over the funeral of a guy named Steve Pulaski. Some of you might remember Steve and Rita Pulaski. They were part of our church for a lot of years. They, they've not been around uh, recently because Steve had really bad cancer. This past week, he passed away. He's been struggling with cancer. And what's interesting is I use this illustration of slinging french fries and I'm doing Steve's funeral tonight and tomorrow. And get this, here's the story of Steve. 43 years ago, 43 years ago, he started his work career job on the line at McDonald's. 
and he retired in August because of his cancer as a global director of IT at McDonald's corporate. Diligence pays off. Hard work pays off, right? Now that may or may not be your experience. Maybe you have been for a long time been slugging away and slugging away and slugging away and you've not gotten anywhere. You've not walked the corporate ladder in like that. But my point is diligence does pay off. My dad modeled this. Some of you know the story of my, my father, right? For, for 68 years, he was in the greenhouse business. 68 years, he owned a landscape company and a floral shop and, and big, huge greenhouses. And, and, and he didn't, didn't retire as the global owner of a nursery that stocked all of Walmart. That would have been awesome. He didn't, he didn't retire like that. But he modeled power and diligence. I'm telling you that right now. For 68 years, my dad got up every single day. And he went to work every day, and he provided for his family, and he provided what we needed, and he modeled the spirit of whatever he was doing. He was going to glorify in his life and glorify God in his work and glorify God in his business, and he did it for 68 years. He worked, he literally worked his fingers to the bone. And when my dad officially retired a couple of years ago, they tore the greenhouses down, you know, he, you know, he began to just sit there on the chair and watch TV. And, and then all of a sudden, I'd say, Daddy, how you doing? He says, man, I was up all night. My hands are just killing me. My, my, my wrists are just killing me. And I said, well, Dad, for 68 years, you worked with your hands, and you tied bows, and you worked with flowers, and you cut, you know, the, the thorns off of rose bushes. And for 68 years, and now you're not doing that, and they're just all cramping up. And so he had carpal tunnel surgery on his left hand, and he's getting ready to have carpal tunnel surgery on his right hand. In August, he turns 89. My dad, he, you know, diligence pays off. Here's another one. Another word of wisdom from Proverbs. Here's what I titled this one. Ready? Get this one down. Learn from the ant. Work hard, but rest well. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 11 is a, is a key verse about work, about rest, about diligence, same as above. It's a verse that talks about preparing for the future and working hard in the good days to prepare for the challenging days. A lot of people sort of know this verse. Here's what it says, Proverbs 6. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer, no ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. What's he called here? The sluggard. The sluggard is the same thing as a lazy person. What does Solomon say? Solomon says, he says he wants the sluggard, the lazy person, to consider the ant. Watch the ant. You all have ants? I hate ants. We have ants. We have ants every spring at our house. I mean, like every spring, I don't know, we must live on an ant farm or something in Plainfield. An old pasture or something with all these ant hills underneath it. Because every springtime, we have all these ants in our house. And I, it just, they just drive us crazy every spring. And sometimes when we wake up in the morning, we've got to keep our house and our kitchen as, as clean as we can. Because the ants, they just attack whatever they can find, right? And I'll wake up in the morning and I'll just take my thumb and I'll just start smushing them, you know, on my counter, you know. You do that. You, I hate ants. And then once in a while, I'll look, and they're on the ground, they're on the floor. There'll be this line of ants, this perfect line. I'm like, where are they coming from, and where are they going to? What are they looking for? And so the other day, I got down on my hands and knees, and I'm just like watching them. Like, where are they going? And lo and behold, there's this little tiny crumb tucked up underneath the counter. We don't have a dog that licks up all the food in our kitchen, you know, some of you do. There they are. Watch the ants. What are they doing? They're gathering food. They're gathering food in the harvest time. And I guess my house is harvest time, you know? <laughs> They're gathering food in the harvest time because I'm assuming that at some point they kind of rest because they stop. And all winter long we don't have them, so they're buried way down there underneath the ground, underneath my house. They're, all the ants in the world live in my backyard, I think. So they, so they rest, Right? Look at how diligently the ant works and works and works, prepares for the cold season. It is, the Bible says, without any chief or officer or ruler, they prepare their bread in the summer and gather food for the harvest, 
the sluggard shouldn't have to wait for someone to tell them what to do. They ought to get out there and do it themselves. Furthermore, I think this passage is interesting. That end of that passage doesn't talk about, doesn't talk about the fact that we shouldn't rest. It talks about the person who's always resting. Who's always resting. What I take from this passage and look at this passage is consider the ant because they do their work when they need to do their work and then they rest. We need to do the same thing. God modeled that at creation. Six days he worked. The seventh day what? He rested. Jesus modeled that throughout his ministry. Work, 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 work. Pull back, rest, pray. We need to do the same thing. Work hard and let your, let, let, let your rest then prepare your mind and your heart and your body for when you have to go back to work. Here's number three, all right? Number three. Trust God to honor your good work. Proverbs 22, verse 29. Have you seen a man skillful at his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before common men. Here's what this proverb, this verse is saying. Write this down, ready? Hard work works. Can you get that down? Hard work works. The diligent person will be promoted above average people to mingle with the prosperous and the successful. One commentator says this, wrote this, education is only a tool, intelligence has marginal value, diligence is key. Hard and persistent effort applied to one's professional duties. Here is the rich and wise King Solomon teaching how to get ahead professionally and economically in the world. And he says, you neglect it to your own poverty. Solomon says, kings... You know, we're the highest persons in the nation. And hard work can take a man from the lower class. And and if if this happens, then you can stand before the king. What if he was just a baker? You know, he's just a lowly baker. He's just down there in his bakery. Well, if he's a good baker and his bread is always fresh and always sweet, you know, if he were diligent, it could not be long before maybe he could get a contract to feed the king in his court, maybe even the army. Consider the life of R.G. Laterna, Christian businessman who, 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 who only completed the sixth grade. But he made up for the lack of educational credentials with hard and long work. The Lord rewarded him with a genius mind. He had over 299 U.S. patents. 299 U.S. patents for heavy equipment. Government sought him out, sought his services, especially during World War II. He made a great deal of money, and he was able to utilize that money for the glory of God with other business and philanthropic projects and religious projects. Trust God with your hard work. And just because you, you, know, you work hard in your business doesn't mean you're going to you know, take over the whole world or whatever. Your diligence and your hard work will pay off. God will honor that. Here's the fourth one. Turn me in here. Complete subject change, all right? You ready? Complete subject subject change. Here's how I entitled this fourth one. Don't be that guy. I don't mean the guy I just showed you the picture of, okay? Don't be this guy that I'm going to describe to you. Do you realize that of the 30 Proverbs that deal with work, working hard, work of your hands, and so forth, the larger percentage of them deal with the lazy worker, the slothful worker. The Bible says the, the sluggard. That's a descriptive word, don't you think? The sluggard, of course, the challenge there is to be a hard worker, a conscientious worker, a focused worker, a productive worker, not an indolent and lethargic and idle worker. Don't be a gold bricker. <laughs> don't be a gold bricker. You know, who always walks around acting like you're always working, you're always worn out, and you're always tired, and then you do nothing. You're just playing the part. Let let me give you several verses here relative to this. Ready? Proverbs 18 and verse 9. I I gave you just one verse on all these other three. Let me give you several on this one. Proverbs 18 and verse 9. He who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. Think about that. He who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 4. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Proverbs 26 and verse 15. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish. It wears him out to bring it back to his mouth. You picture this? Picture this, all right? The sluggard, the lazy person. Picture this guy. Big old lazy dude propped up in his big old lazy boy. He's got his remote in one hand. Don't try to take it from him. 
And he's so lazy that he takes his right hand and he puts it in the bowl of Cheetos and he's so lazy he can't even bring it back to his own mouth. Don't be that guy. Don't worry. The hand of the diligent will rule while the slothful will be put to forced labor. Folks, listen, this is what the Solomon is saying. This is what the proverb writers are saying. All of these verses and more encourage us to stay away from not only being lazy ourselves, but also associating with the sluggard that he or she might drag us down. Don't be that person. Don't be that person. You know that person, don't you? At your workplace, yes? You know that person. You find yourself getting angry at that person. You talk about that person to your coworkers. You complain to your boss about that person. Don't be that person. Some of you have even switched jobs because, because your whole workplace is filled with people like that. And you don't want to be that kind of person. They make you look bad. They drag everybody else down. You see Solomon and the other Hebrew sages say time and time again, time again, they exhort us to not be that person. Laziness uh, leads to poverty. Laziness leads to ruin. Laziness leads to a sense of entitlement. And laziness, look at this, can lead to a wreckage of a family, wreckage of a job, wreckage of a life wreckage of a, mar- of a marriage. It can even lead to wreckage uh, of an entire life. Don't be that person. More so, look up here. If you are that person, if you are that lazy person at your workplace, you know you, know you are. You know you are. Don't be that person. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, You say, you know what? I'm going to give my best. I know what's expected of me. I know what I need to do. I'm going to be faithful to do what I'm called to do. And as I do that, look at this, I'm going to glorify God in what I do. So if you are that person, (laughs) if you are a gold bricker, you know, you can can tomorrow start to make a difference. Because here's the bottom line. It matters to God. Our work matters to God. Our work life matters to God. Our rest from work matters to God. Work, work is God's gift to us. Have you ever thought of that before? Your job, your job is God's gift to you. And when we work, no matter what we do, no matter what we do, we serve people. We earn money, not only to meet the needs of ourselves and our family, but we're able to give to others and honor Christ through our stewardship and more than anything else. And I disagree with old Bob Black, through work we love God. And some of you here today, you're, you're looking for a job, you know, and I'm going to pray with you that you find that job and you find that job soon. And when you find that job soon, that you can then say, you know what, this job, this new job, this new opportunity, fresh opportunity for me to be Jesus like never before. When we work, we are obeying the two greatest commandments that God gave us, to love Him and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We love Him by, by, by obeying Him from the heart. We love our neighbor as we serve other people through our work. We bring glory to God by working diligently, productively, actively, and energetically, demonstrating what He is like and serving others by cooperating with God to meet their needs. In serving God we, and in working, we serve God. So think about it that way. And that's why our work matters to God. So listen, I know sometimes can work can wear us out. It's imperative to change jobs or get a new career. Some of that's forced upon you, but you get a new career, new job, you can keep on working. And listen, it's even right to retire and to rest. Two years ago, after 68 years in the greenhouse business, this developer comes out to my dad and says, Pete, I want to buy the property underneath your greenhouse. I want to build some condos. And my dad calls us, the siblings, the four of us, and he says, this guy wants to build condos underneath, you know, from the ground that the greenhouse sits on, which would mean that I have to tear the greenhouses down and I'll be retired. What do you think? And we're like, Dad, you're 87. I think it's okay. And the siblings, we were like, Daddy, what do you think? He said, well, you know, honestly, I would just be tickled to be able to stop. And with tears in our eyes, we're like, Dad, that's awesome. And he's like, what am I going to do? I don't, I don't know. Just relax. 
He said, yeah, but for a lot of years, I've seen people retire at age 65, and two weeks later, they're dead and in the ground, and I'm doing their funeral flowers for them. I don't want to die. I said, well, Dad, you don't have to retire, you know, equate retiring to dying. It doesn't have to be the same, you know. For the last bunch of years, he's just been relaxing and resting. And I'm so happy for my dad. May God give us the strength every day to work hard every day, to work hard to the best of our abilities, to reflect his love and grace. And when we work and see him in everything we do, get this, your job, no matter what it is, can be done to the glory of Jesus. Amen. Heavenly Father, we can see the principle of working hard as a command from you, and it is in the best interests of the one who works diligently. Jesus believed in hard work prior to the beginning of his earthly ministry. God, we know that he was a carpenter, and, and carpenters in those days didn't just mean woodworking, but they worked with large timbers and stones, and, and it was all manual labor, of course, without the aid of any power tool, so everything was done by hand. Jesus worked hard, and he even said, my father is always working, and so am I, and so must we be. We must all work so that we won't be in hunger. We can work to help those who cannot work for themselves for whatever the reason. God, the Bible has so much to say about laziness and none of it's good. So God, lead us as we live life, as we work, and as we honor you through whatever we do. In Jesus we pray. Amen.